Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to today's seminar. It's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff. He is currently at Johns Hopkins University at the Department of Ophthalmology. Jeff did his uh, PhD uh, in um, Washington University. Um, <laughs> And he also did his postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Washington University working with um, Dr. Rachel Wong. Um, and he was mainly working and looking at dendritic targeting um, in Drosophila, uh, sorry, zebrafish. That's what, and he's been working with zebrafish for a long time. After he uh, finished his postdoctoral fellowship, he uh, actually formed a, a biotech company and he served as a research director of a company in, uh, called Luminomics. And he was probably based on um, his unique way of ablating cells in zebrafish so they can screen um, for drugs for uh, cell regeneration. He sort of parted away from the biotech company and he uh, joined the faculty at the um, Augusta University in Georgia in 2008 and started his own lab and, and, and continuing to work in zebrafish. He then joined uh, Johns Hopkins University in 2014 as a uh, associate professor there, and he's currently um, also serving as a uh, co-director at the zebrafish core at the uh, Johns Hopkins University. As you can see from his title, you know, he's been using uh, zebrafish as a um, whole organism model to, uh, to screen for drug discovery and uh, for all uh, different types of uh, disease models. And um, what I could gather that uh, he's been funded from a variety of uh, institutes from National Eye Institute, including National Institute of uh, Mental Health, um, NEI, NINDS, and National Cancer Institute, uh, serving as a, a co-I. Um, but I know that he's also working a lot with live imaging in the fish, looking at immune cells and how they behave in different conditions. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to learning new, new things in the fish from his talk. So thank you for visiting, and the podium is all yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Kevin and, and Vance uh, for the invitation. It's really nice to be down here and to see some old friends as well. It's, it's been a really nice morning and I look forward to this afternoon. Um, to launch right in here, because I probably loaded this thing up too much as, as usual, so I'm going to try to zip through some of the stuff that's a little bit easier to understand. Um, I just, at the outset, I do want to say there are awarded and pending patents on some of this stuff, so uh, it, you know I need to disclose that. And there was a company that was formed around it uh, that I was initially a director for, but um, now just sort of their customer more than anything else. They, uh, they have the robot that I use to do the drug screening. And um, so, you know, what it all comes down to to me is, is basically using the fish for the things that it can provide unique perspectives about. I think as a biologist, I think that's the trick to it, finding a species that is really uh, an excellent example of a particular kind of biology and leveraging the fact that they can do that really well to learn something about it. And uh, so, there's a couple of other things that they do just technically though, and that is that they develop really, really rapidly. They go from a single cell to sort of a, a, a recognizable vertebrate form in 24 hours, and you know, a couple days later, they look like an eye on a stick. And for a retinal biologist, that's pretty good because the eye's clearly very important to them or it wouldn't be so big. And in fact, they, at about this stage, start to forage uh, for food and, and also try not to be food. So they're actually up and active as a vertebrate within four days. We can also then sort of turn them into a Crayola box and light up different cells or different cellular compartments and tissues in different colors to look at interactions uh, using confocal microscopy. And a large part of my lab uses time-lapse-based intravital imaging to try to gain new insights about how cells interact during different paradigms, such as degeneration. Um, and that, that, of course, you know, can, just a good example here of the, the cellular detail that can be had with that kind of technique. We're looking at the eye now and a particular population of bipolar cells. Here's the lens, interplexiform layer, and then the cyan pro, uh, fluorescent protein is pretty much just sort of a background stain allowing you to see uh, context in that particular line. 
well, like I said, we can also put these kind of things in motion. You're looking at the entire orbit now. Uh, in, in this case, rod photoreceptors lit up in yellow and microglia and macrophages lit up in red. As the photoreceptors are induced to die, you can see the macrophages go from a ramified classic homeostatic state into a highly rounded and migratory state that uh, is showing their relative reactivity to that photoreceptor cell death. And we use that to interrogate how they impinge upon the regenerative process. And for me, I think in terms of really gaining perspective, that's where the large focus of my lab exists. So it's a bit of a side tour, but I want to definitely give props to that idea of using them as a platform for regeneration, even though today's talks about neuroprotection. Um, and, and that, in fact, I really like this quote. It sort, of, it sort of articulates what I was trying to say earlier much better. And supposedly it's from Hippocrates, but it just lays out that idea of, of using something in nature uh, for the excellence that it exhibits as a way to learn about that. In the absence of that, things can be very difficult, say, to make a mouse regenerate, I would say, is harder than breaking that process in a fish in terms of a learning paradigm. Okay, so regenerative biology is probably some of the oldest experimental biology out there. And certain, certain scholars in the field would claim that, in fact, experimental biology came out of studies of things like snails and stuff way back in the 15 and 1600s, that that was our first foray into really manipulating the system and asking what happens downstream of that. Um, but by and large, it's a field populated by these really dramatic examples of things like whole on limb regeneration or whole body regeneration in the case of planaria and hydra. And of course, in, in, in zebrafish context, Ken Poss's work on heart regeneration and Gilbert Weidinger's as well uh, made quite a splash when, it, when that was revealed. Um, conversely, the more recent sort of field of regenerative medicine focuses on a, on a much different scale of problem by and large. And that is degenerative diseases that involve the loss of typically at the onset at least to one particular cell type, sometimes then more than one cell type downstream of that. But there's usually a particular candidate we're after in terms of the health and well-being of people with those kind of diseases that really scale that problem down dramatically. And so it's kind of unclear whether the lessons learned in regenerative biology could be directly translated into regenerative medicine, which, you know, like I said, deals with the loss of specific cell types. And one of the things that as a postdoc, looking at that and being very interested in regeneration in general, we kind of wanted to find a way to bridge that gap. We started looking for ways to basically apply uh, the kind of rich sort of platforms available for regenerative biology in regenerative med medicine contexts. And by that, I mean, can we find ways to interrogate how specific cell types are regenerated? And at the time, really, other than hair cell regeneration and muscle, there wasn't much on that front. There was two cell types that had been, been worked up fairly well in that regard, satellite cells and regeneration of muscle fibers, and hair cell regeneration being facilitated by the fact that antibiotics kill hair cells in the inner ear and along what's called the neuromast of, of zebrafish. But a main question we had was, can we extend that to just about any other cellular type, and is there a lot to learn by being able to apply that to things like dopaminergic neurons in the case of Parkinson's and other diseases? And so we set about trying to define a way to get a cell-specific regeneration paradigms um, in play. Uh, and, and with that kind of technology, we could also dissect single cell type function. And presumably, if you, the system operated optimally, it might even be useful for degenerative disease modeling. And so how do you do that? Well, you go to the literature and you steal things. And what I stole was the idea of a prodrug converting enzyme therapy from cancer therapeutics. In cancer, you want to kill cancer. In our case, we want to kill particular cell types. It's the same idea, particular cell types, only the cancer in their case, only, say, amacrine cells of the eye in our case. But we um, found that what they had done is lifted a bacterial enzyme uh, directly out of bacteria and then expressed that either through genetic methods or antibody-directed mechanisms to bring that to cancer cells. And that enzyme then is able to convert prodrugs into um, cytotoxic substances. And the name of that enzyme was nitroreductase. And so being able to transgenically express that in and around the fish allows us then, in theory, to uh, sensitize those cells to prodrug substances that typically were antibiotics, because nitroreductase is one of the genes that we leverage to kill bacteria uh, with antibiotic substances. So step three then was just to link that to a fluorescent reporter so that we can watch the cells coming and going. 
Step four is to add that prodrug to the water the fish live in so you can induce a particular kind of re degeneration in, in as many fish as you want on a given day, and then remove it to allow regeneration to happen, right? Fairly straightforward. Um, and then again, like I said, you can use this high resolution imaging um, to get after what happens in terms of who the stem cells are and who's impinging on stem cell activities. But you can also, by virtue of the fluorescent reporter, uh, presumably use high throughput methods to let you quantify the presence or absence of the cells to get after things that promote regeneration or, or promote neuroprotection. And that seemed simple enough, right? We made these day glow bright fish. I thought, you know, I had biochemistry background as a graduate student. We did these plate reader based luminescence and fluorescence based assays all day long to look at transcriptional profiles. We should be able to just quantify these fluorescent fish. But um, that wasn't quite as easy as it turned out. Oh, this slide's out of place. Okay, so all of that preamble was not for this side. <laughs> uh, anyway, here's just an example of that, right? I go back to that original image I showed you. It turns out the red cells were the ones expressing nitroreductase. Their sister cells are expressing some a little bit of nitroreductase, some yellow, and there's some that are really expressing yellow. It's really just a trick of this bipartite expression system. But suffice it to say, the ones that are purely yellow provide a direct neighbor kind of control for the specificity of the system. And you can see after you add the prodrug, the red cells are by and large gone or fragmented, and the ones that are only yellow appear to be uh, surviving. You then wash the uh, metronidazole out, and you get uh, the return of the red cells over a course of like two to three, four days. Okay, so that lends to the question of whether that occurs by a different mechanism than whole on multi-tissue or multicellular regeneration. Is it possible that the loss of a particular cell type ends up eliciting a different kind of non-developmental regeneration, but actually more targeted toward uh, a biased process toward that cell fate only? And we and others use some lineage tra tracing techniques to find that that is indeed um, definitely a possibility. If you limit the amount of cells you're killing, in the case of just taking advantage of, of random expression patterns in these lines, some labeling lots of bipolars, others only a few, the, the results of the lineage tracing were markedly different. We kill lots of bipolar cells, we get lineage traces into ganglion cell layers, inner plexiform layer and outer plexiform layer cells. But when we do it only within the context of the bipolar cells, only cells in the inner nuclear layer that look positioned in and, and can even have synaptic sort of ending that look like bipolar cells come back. And similar groups looking at um, amacrine cell ablation and cone photoreceptor ablation using our system found the same kind of thing. So it's kind of an interesting paradigm shift when you think about uh, what techniques and what therapeutics you might need or might be helpful for gaining better specificity, uh, this idea that the systems can respond in a very selective way rather than creating lots of cells that aren't needed is an interesting uh, possibility. Okay, so um, the, I'm gonna shift gears now and go to the, the degeneration story. And at the outset of this, really, I think there's two interesting phenomenon that a lot of the students in the room are facing that I didn't predict, and certainly if I'd known about it when I was a student, I might have ran screaming from the field, because there's been two things that have happened that I think are, are pretty daunting for you guys, and that is lots and lots of data, right? The, the, the amount of data that you're being basically harnessed with uh, is, is really, really incredible. I think there's a lot of power in it, but I think we don't know what we're doing with it 99% of the time. I'm um, just going to state that, and uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big problem. I mean, we seem to be drunk on it. We think the solution to this is actually doing more and more and more of it when we haven't really even grappled with the data we were generating with microarrays very well. We're already into single-cell RNA-seq, but okay, enough soapboxing. The other one is that because of combinatorial chemistry, the number of drugs that are out there that need to be tested in some meaningful way went from tens of thousands to millions, right? And both of these are are really quite difficult problems at the level of scale. I would like to propose that there's a potential solution to both of them. And, uh, all right, okay, so, yeah, so, so sorry, you know, name your omics, to-do list galore come out of this, and, and like I said, combinatorial chemistry leading to that. But the potential solution I'd like to say is lots of fish. One of the things that they're really, really good at, another advantage they have is that mothers and fathers give rise to lots and lots of offspring. And so we can actually generate tens of thousands of them uh, you know, with, uh, with a certain amount of rigmarole, but we can generate lots of them on a given Tuesday. 
uh, for large-scale screening, either of a, either of a genetic or, or drug screening manner. And today I'm going to basically focus in on the lots of drug problem. Okay? So, like I said, our basic interests are retinal degenerative disease and retinal regeneration. And um, uh, I, I want to say that uh, there was a tagline at the start of the talk with HDS ready degenerative disease modeling in fish. And I want to define some of the terms so that we're all on the same page. And that would be um, HDS ready, basically enabling what the industry, and by the industry, I mean pharmaceutical companies would consider high throughput. A lot of my colleagues claim they're doing high throughput biology in fish if they screen 20,000 fish, uh, which I would say pharmaceutical industry isn't going to agree with that. And so uh, I would say that, you know, there's a loose definition there, but their basically definition of that is around 50,000 a day. We don't get there. And I think I'm screening fish faster than anybody else on the planet right now. So I think we need to be careful about calling these high throughput screens. I, even I say ours are high throughput ready. They're not there yet. Okay. And then the kind of screening you can do um, with high throughput screening is both um, what I would call true high throughput capacities, and then there's high content. And in in vivo context, I'd argue we aren't really able to match that pace with imaging technology, with 3D imaging technologies just yet, but I look forward to the day we can. In terms of degenerative disease model, pretty loosely just the loss of anything that leads to a physiological deficit, right? And there's inducible and then genetic or mutational models there. Modeling, um, I would say in terms of the way we modeled things, right, there's been some new insights that came out of this particular neuroprotective study that really opened my eyes to the fact that perhaps what, what was, in my opinion, a really, really bad idea, uh, screening these kind of artificially induced cell death events for neuroprotectants, turns out to occur by a cell death pathway that may be much more relevant to disease than uh, certainly I ever imagined. I seem to be hooked to the podium here in a weird kind of way. Okay, yeah, that's dangerous. Um, and finally, uh, large scale, just meaning um, the kind of uh, drug screening we're doing with this system. Because it's chemically inducible, it just lends itself uh, to scaling up to about as fast as you can go currently. Okay. So HTS ready. Back to, I think, the preamble I had a long time ago. Um, uh, basically, whole allergen high content screening, not yet HTS compatible. And the image acquisition speeds and analysis basically prohibits really high throughput rates. And um, I would say that it'd be nice to get there but uh, that, that we really can't do that yet. I think you can do it in cell culture, but we can't do it with fish. So that brings us to some kind of rapidly quantifiable readout. And like I said, my background and training basically drew me to the idea of a plate reader-based assay. And it seemed, as I said, really, really simple at the outset. Um, but it took about two years to get there because most plate readers, unbeknownst to me, made an assumption of homogeneity in the well and only read 3% of the well, right down the center um, and at the absolute nadir of a standard 96 well. Meanwhile, a fish floats around wherever it wants, both in the Z dimension and in the XY dimension, making that a really difficult uh, problem to have to solve, just um, practically speaking. And then companies came along that allowed us to like look in different regions, but they do you the favor of averaging those nine things into one. And that, of course, erased all your signal again. There was one company, TCAN, and their infinite M1000 that actually gave us reports of those individual areas. And as you can see, when the fish was in these four quadrants, we got good signal. But certainly if I were to average that with the rest, I'd squash uh, the ability to see these things. So that simple trick, being able to focus in the Z dimension and get sort of uh, individually regionalized reports allowed us to go from nothing, absolutely no machine could ever see a fish, to actually signal to noise ratios approaching 100 to one, even up to 1,000 to one with really good reporters. Okay, so how does it work then? Well, you hook something like that up, which is capable of around 200,000 of fish. Now your problem becomes getting fish into micro wells at that rate. And so um, we worked with a robotics company and with a company called Union Biometrica to essentially use what is, for all intents and purposes, a fax sorter for organisms. It looks at fluorescence profiles and, and deposits them into multi-well formats. And that machine slows us down. The plate reader, like I said, is capable of doing 200,000 a day. We're able to do around 10 to 20 because of just having to get them all arrayed like that. But that still lets us do some really nice tricks like dose response in the primary screening stage, which is a thing called quantitative high throughput screening, 
markedly reduces false discovery rates, both in terms of things you might have missed because they weren't effective at a singular dosage, and eliminating false positives that are sort of spuriously active at a singular concentration. Um, also allows us that kind of pace to really use power statistics and other kinds of vetted statistics to ensure we have proper sample sizes for everything we do. And I think that's worth its weight in gold for sure. And um, kind of ironically, rather than running as fast as we can, we started out with this idea of repurposing compound libraries on the order of 3,000 or so, which were about as many human approved compounds as were available back when we got started. And the real value of this I'll get to later it wasn't so much this idea of repurposing, but it actually had to do with the fact that a lot of um, you know, assays had already been done with these molecules, and a lot was known about them already. So it provide fairly rapid inroads into the biology at hand. OK, so why bother? Uh, basically, I covered some of this. But beyond just all the advantages of going this fast, I think we were able to see subtler effects. And I think that that's really important. I think all or none sort of binary assays in, in chemical biology are usually pushed to the extremes again. And they're showing you things that are a kind of different kind of kinetically exaggerated biology that may or may, not, may or may not be relevant to diseases that happen over decades. And we also get more hits, which allows us you know, bigger windows of opportunity to learn more about the biology at hand, and a thing called polypharmacology, uh, which I think in the end is, is a field I'd really like to leverage more and more as we move forward. OK, so uh, I think we've been through some of these fighting words. Um, but I would argue that, that genetic models put into these kind of paradigms suffer the same sort of problem that we, looking at human patients, deal with, and that's that the onset of the diseases is randomized individual to individual across the spectrum. So having the, no discrete onset makes it really difficult, it makes your sample sizes go through the roof if you were trying to do this with a genetic model system. But if you start with one of these inducible, temporally synced systems, like a drug-inducible system like we had, I think we are able to basically pull that down into a range where we can do um, some fairly quick and, 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 and rapidly efficient um, mechanisms. And I think they also probably lend themselves to more of a pan disease rather than sort of genetically driven argument that might be relevant only for given patient uh, subpopulations. OK, I already showed you this. Don't know why that's there. Let's move on. Oh, I, I, yeah, so this works for cellular regeneration, cell-specific uh, functional assays. But this idea of degenerative disease modeling, like I told you, I thought it was crazy. And the foundation fighting blindness basically argued with me <laughs> to give me money. And I was stupid enough to be arguing the opposite of that. And eventually, I realized that was silly. Why don't we take this money and, and learn some things about the system that we really didn't understand very well? And that's how the cells are dying. OK, so um, the disease we chose to go after, uh, mainly because we were able to target them really easy transgenically, were um, diseases involving the loss of rod photoreceptors, so retinitis pigmentosa and related inherited retinal diseases. You take those things away, and you've got uh, you know, loss of night vision initially, and then subsequently loss of cones that lead to total blindness. Um, but in the case of fish, like I told you, the Mueller glia, the major radial glia of the retina, can actually produce new progenitor cells that go on to solve that problem, right? So we, a large part of the lab studies that particular thing. But the other thing um, that we are very interested in doing is asking whether, well, okay, we lose some of these things. Can we bring compounds in to protect the others that are there to survive? And that's really um, the state of the art right now, therapeutically, within the context of retinal disease is just promoting the survival of things that exist so that further loss of visual capacities don't happen. OK, so here's what it looks like in terms of the imaging. Um, without prodrug, uh, the line has a lot of photoreceptors down here in the ventral domain, which is not part of the transgene at all. That's actually normal. That's where most of their photo rod photoreceptors exist. Um, suggests that they do a lot of feeding at night at the, in the dorsal domain of, of, of water. And uh, once we put in this prodrug called metronidazole, we elicit DNA damage that leads to cell death. And here you can see them all beating up uh, two days later. OK. Um, we then titrated that metronidazole down so that we can reduce it to a minimum amount that gave us maximal loss rates at two days, um, but giving the neuroprotectants the best chance of working against the system without being simply swamped out by the amount of prodrug. And um, we made some assumptions then at the onset. And that was that RP is caused by apoptosis, which literature from roughly 
30 years ago told us. Hasn't really been updated much, frankly. Uh, and then that there was also uh, some uh, indications in the literature from our group that that system might induce apoptosis, although frankly we couldn't reproduce some of the more definitive things like caspase 3 activation that others had shown with antibodies we found to be questionable. Yeah, yeah, like, like with the movie that I showed earlier, the, the microglia macrophages, yeah, become very polarized and become uh, phagocytic, proliferative, and the, the, whole, the whole gamut there. Um, and so Li Yunzhang uh, was the postdoc brave enough to take this on, despite all the caveats of whether this was truly a degenerative disease model or not. On day one, she uses these little tubs from Lowe's, which are a lot cheaper than the $10,000 mass egg production units you can buy commercially to get lots and lots and lots of eggs. Uh, and then we just grow them up normally. We add some inhibitors to keep them non-pigmented, or add inhibitor to keep them non-pigmented so that we can see the reporters better. Day four, the drugs get dispensed by standard liquid handling machines. Day five, that organismal fact sorter shoves them into individual wells, and the drug uh, and metronidas all get added as well. And then on day seven, we look at them with the plate reader, and we have an automated uh, software program we developed in R to give us immediate statistical readouts on all of that. Okay, and here is two years of her life in a single slide. About 350,000 fish, uh, roughly 3,000 drugs, based on statistical calls alone, something called strictly standardized mean difference, uh, greater than one. We had about 114 hits. We then looked at those in terms of their dose response, in terms of their SSMD score, and we pulled out 42 that became our high priority hits and shoved them through a series of secondary validation and orthogonal screens, and that resulted in 11 of the 42 advancing as lead drug candidates. And so I'll take you through some of that now. Here's just those 11 in terms of their effect size, which varied from about 38% survival down to around 10% survival, all of which the p-values are, are quite, uh, I, I'm trying to avoid the word significant. I've been reading a lot of this literature about Let's stop talking about that and just say effect sizes and you think 38% survival is good, then that's a good thing. Maybe 10% is questionable, who knows? Uh, clinicians would have a better idea. Uh, anyway, we then went in as a validation screen and just did confocal imaging. Here's the negative control. You can see there's very few cells that survive after that. Positive control, quite a few cells up in that dorsal domain. And then we just looked in that dorsal kind of quadrant again and again and found with the exception of the one that's only around 10% survival, most seem to be providing pretty good survival effects at the level of, of imaging as well as this plate reader-based uh, non-imaging, I should emphasize, purely quantitative readout. Um, we then did 3D volumetric quantification of those to verify that what we were seeing by eye looked uh, you know, proper, and by and large, the effect sizes were comparable to the effect sizes we saw with the plate reader, so that all looks good. Um, we then asked the biggest question that made me doubt the whole thing from the very beginning, and do these things inhibit nitroreductase directly, right? That was, that's all I thought we were gonna find. I thought this was gonna be a huge boondoggle. And, um, and we worked with a guy named David Ackerley in New Zealand, who's an expert in nitroreductase enzymology, and he's got a very nice assay to look at um, the kinetics of prodrug conversion, and we basically set 75% values as a cutoff, and by and large, most of them didn't have any activity, even at 300 micromolar, which is two orders of magnitude above what we were having, what we were doing for the drug screen, right? So well above um, those levels. He then did the IC50s on these that did have some ability to inhibit, and we found that still the IC50s suggested that we're still two orders of magnitude away from the, the effective concentrations. So even though we do see uh, some activity at 300 micromolar, his best guess is, is down at four micromolar and below levels. They really aren't capable of doing that. Unfortunately, the assay isn't uh, powerful enough to assess their activity at four micromolar, which would have been the optimal way to do it. Um, and then we just asked some very simple questions about whether the compounds are simply promoting rod photoreceptor neogenesis. Do they simply promote rod cell fates at the expense of other cell fates and take advantage of the fact that maybe all the cells being born uh, aren't uh, totally faded at that point? And I'm happy to say that none of them showed any direct effects. In fact, a couple seem to be inhibitory against rod cell fate, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, and we also had an assay to test whether they're effective at promoting regeneration 
Uh, second screen that I hope to be able to come back and talk about someday because I think that'll be a lot of fun as well. But in that case, the drugs aren't added along with the metronidazole. They're added after, uh, 24 hours after the induction of cell death. And we look for uh, kinetic change that we'd seen with glucocorticoids in the case of uh, work on, on inflammatory signaling we'd done previous. And again, none of them had any capacity to promote regeneration. So we think the neuroprotective effects are definitely um, directly on, on the cells that are fated to die, or not quite fated, but at least induced to die, and uh, set about uh, marching forward into asking whether any of this is conserved across other species. And to do that, we worked with Don Zach um, to simply take primary retinal neurons out of mouse eyes, stick them in culture, by virtue of which, with the added element of things like tunicomycin or tapsogargan, they die over again, about a 48-hour time period and asked whether any of our compounds were active in that. And it turned out that about six of nine lead drug candidates that were tested did have activity in at least all retinal cells or when we actually sorted for GFP positive photoreceptors, uh, different subpopulations were active in that, which looked pretty good. Um, but we wanted a little bit more kind of in vivo context, if you will. And so we worked with Barb Rohrer down at the Medical University of, of South Carolina uh, who takes out retinal explants from RD1 retinal um, pigmentosa models. This is a, a mutant in the, in the gene PDE6B. It exhibits sort of a rapid loss of rods over the course of P10 to P18 in explants and, and in vivo as well. And um, simply tested, uh, I think, six, I can't remember, six or eight, um, across three different concentrations, refreshing the drug every day over about a week in culture there. And um, that to much to my uh, you know, surprise and, and happiness, about three of those six um, gave quite good results. Uh, and in fact, this one, dihydroartemisinin, which is actually the active metabolite of artemisinin, both of those came up as hits in our screen, um, was, was by far the best. And so we went forward with in vivo based screening of another retinal degeneration model, and I won't bore you with that because it's been negative to date. Uh, we kind of hyper-engineered it by encasing dihydro in, in uh, PLGA to create a long-release formula and all kinds of things we probably shouldn't have bothered to do before we just tested it directly. Uh, but suffice it to say, so far, we can't get that to work uh, yet in, in the RD10 model system. And that's just all summarized here over the course of the whole thing, how we got uh, through the whole process, starting with the 114 compounds, winnowing down to 11, confirming with confocal, then whether they inhibited nitroreductase directly, uh, rod genesis and the like. And you can see here just in green and orange all that summarized where these 11 that had activity in zebrafish, again, a sub nice subset had activity in mouse, uh, then in uh, mouse retinal explants then, a further subset that kind of narrowed us down to looking at dihydroartemisinin in, in vivo. And that's where we're at um, currently with the in vivo work. Yeah. Yeah, this really, uh, that's a heartache story. We, we, we did have like a OKR uh, machine that called the Visio Tracker. Um, this initial iteration of the nitroductase uh, really is not a very good enzyme. That's why we need almost toxic levels of prodrugs to get cells to ablate. And we only ever get down to around 80% of rod loss. And we never saw by any metric we could measure any real, like uh, especially those kind of highly reflexive assays. They're just kind of way more robust than, than that kind of deficit um, uh, allows. With a new version, again, working with that guy in New Zealand, we've come up with a new version of nitroductase, about 100-fold more potent. And now we can get pretty much absolute complete ablation of cells. And we've um, been using a retinal ganglion cell model um, I sorry, I was supposed to repeat that question. I forgot about that. The question was, do we have any functional readouts for visual visual function? Um, for the sake of the video, they wanted me to repeat that. And uh, in that case, uh, the fish have this really nice, whether they're blind or not, kind of simple assay where they're kind of like cuttlefish. They expand their melanophores up if they deem themselves to be in the dark to kind of fit into the background. And um, when we ablate ganglion cells with that model, we can definitely see that they no longer kind of reverse that in a light, lighted environment. I asked that question because um, in our translational studies looking at anti-apoptotic mm. therapeutics, yep. we sometimes can delay the cell death, but then if we go out uh, a couple weeks after they go ahead and die anyway, yep. it's kind of stop, it's difficult to stop the cascade once it starts. It's obviously 
Yep. This is a very good point. Um, the gentleman's asking about the fact that therapeutically or in the models, if you inhibit a cell death pathway, you might get the cells to survive a bit, um, but that as things progress, they seem to lose any capacity to gain visual function from that. And I think that's a very good point. And something that, that, that I think in the next phase of this, I'm gonna struggle with a bit, whether we're gonna run, I, I've heard about apoptosis inhibitors a lot from that particular perspective. And I think we may be, um, susceptible to the same kind of problem that we can either promote the survival of essentially sick cells that don't have much functional benefit to the you know at the onset anyway or that we lose efficacy over time both of those are definite concerns okay uh, so what's what are these aerial errors about over here and this is where the talk gets a little bit more fun because gets into mechanism which um, like I told you at the outset was one of the benefits of this FDA approved library and so a poor man's version of, of artificial intelligence is just to go to PubChem, and to the extent that these drugs that we found, these 11 candidates over here, had already been shoved through a number of target-based quantitative high-throughput assays in cell culture, we could put together a matrix of how many different potential pathways we're talking about, like uh, androgen receptors and glucocorticoid receptors and, and uh, retinoic uh, pathways, estrogen receptor, all kinds of things, dopaminergic, P53, and put together this matrix that basically, you know, in aggregate, oh, in aggregate's a little bit scary, but it also suggests that there's probably um, the possibility of some additive effects here, that they don't all go down the same pathways, so therefore there should be some complementation in there. So just to start out, we thought, okay, one of, again, one of the advantages of the fish is that we can do these things fairly quickly at scale so we did a lot of paired drug analyses and took um, all of them basically and, and shoved them through different pairs and were able to find um, uh, in 10 of 19 tested cases that we got either additive or in sometimes sort of supra additive effects where the pure additive values of the two was in and around here, but we could get in and above that. And in cases like 42% just by pure math, we get 56% when we put them together and, and the like 16 and 40. And so that's pretty, pretty uh, intriguing, I'd say, that, you know, I think I'm not a clinician, but I would say 58% survival is definitely clinically significant, it, whether it's statistically significant or not, I'm not, not going to make the argument, but I would say if I could tell somebody I could save half of their rod photoreceptors, they'd be pretty happy about that. And, and so I think this just opens the door to that idea of polypharmacology or, or combinatorial chemistry that, um, that I think is a real... Um, avenue that we want to leverage going forward, for sure. But the other thing that sort of stuck out, uh, uh, stuck out, stuck out, stuck out to us when we looked at that is there was one particular pathway that seemed to be kind of a lowest common denominator. And I didn't know anything about this tyrosol DNA phosphodiesterase one um, when we looked at it. But, uh, and it didn't make any sense at all, frankly. I'll get to, get to why that is the case in a minute. But one thing that um, we did find when we looked into the, the assay that was done here and followed up on some of the literature there, we found out that despite the fact that the target was supposed to be TDP1, the compounds that were identified in the screen were actually a different enzyme called PARP1. They were all PARP1 inhibitors. And that sort of rang bells in my head. I'd heard about PARP1 um, with related cancer field as well as um, some, some new information about neurodegeneration. And so we wanted to follow up on that. And so the first thing we did was just go back to the chemical toolbox and grab a bunch of PARP pathway related inhibitors and um, tested eight of them that were either direct PARP1 or PARP1 and 2. This is a fairly large uh, family of polymerases. Um, and uh, there's at least uh, eight or nine different PARPs. And then there's variations on the, on the theme TNKs. And so pan-PARP inhibitors and um, this whole panel of eight different PARP inhibitors had um, you know, relevant levels of, of survival effects. We also tested uh, necroptosis inhibitors and apoptosis inhibitors. And um, this is kind of intriguing to us that despite the fact that people claim this nitroreductase system goes through apoptotic mechanisms, the apoptosis inhibitor didn't seem to have any effect at all, whereas the necroptosis did, in fact. And um, we also tested TDP1, and, and we think that uh, is potentially relevant as well. But like I said, because of the bells that were going off in my head, uh, the PARP pathway was the one we wanted to pay the most attention to. So we, 
went in and, and tried to learn a bit about this. And this is how it doesn't make sense. Essentially, PARP1 and DDP, TDP1 are both primarily, their day jobs are DNA repair enzymes. My god, I did it again. This is really strange. OK. <laughs> Ripping my pants. Um, uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, their day job is to repair DNA damage. And I don't know if you remember, but I told you that that's what our system does, right? So how in the world can eliciting DNA damage be somehow benefited by inhibiting a DNA repair enzyme? It should be the exact opposite. And um, long story short is that's not the only thing PARP does. This may be its day job, but at night it, it moonlights uh, in, a, in a cell death pathway that's now been termed parthanatose, and that's because it is a poly-ADP ribose, the first three letters of PARP, uh, dependent form of cell death. So you shove the Greek personification of death together with PAR and you get parthanatose. And how that works is that DNA damage basically uh, activates PARP um, to ribosylate DNA and, and proteins as well, so you get an increase of poly-ADP ribose throughout the nucleus and cytoplasm, that ribosylation process leads to the release from mitochondria of, of somewhat paradoxically the apoptosis-inducing factor. But in, in the context of this particular cell death pathway, that inducing factor actually partners up with an enzyme that has a really unfortunate name, macrophage inhibitory factor, which is in fact a nuclease that then translocates the nuclease and the MIF uh, continues to fragment DNA that's already damaged so that they kill cells that presumably have sort of tipped over some rheostat set point of too much DNA damage, right? So it goes from being a repair process to an active cell death pathway, presumably at some level of DNA damage that it deems it can't handle. And so other than NMDA excit cytotoxicity stroke and NM MNNG models, we'd like to propose that nitroductase system that we use kind of plops in here as well as another mechanism um, to, to, to mediate this. And, and I should mention, this is totally caspase independent. So it's a completely independent form of death than, than apoptosis. And it has certain biochemical signatures that kind of come along for the ride with all this. Unfortunately, biochemistry is one of the areas that fish aren't advantageous. In fact, they suck worse than probably any model system out there. And so we actually collaborated with um, Val Canto Salar, who used to be at uh, Hopkins of Omer, now she's at Colorado running her own stem cell group. And she uh, basically used our nitroidexase system to create transgenic organoid models with that and could introduce um, or induce cell death in those. And using those, we're both able, this assay is okay for fish. The, the, the um, PAR antibodies are pretty good. We can see that upon induction of cell death, we get a massive upregulation of PAR in fish and in the organoid models here. But she was able to go a little bit further and show actual translocation to the nucleus of AIF and MIF as well, as you'd predict uh, if the pathway is active uh, to become a, a cell death pathway. And so um, of the sort of seven different sort of hallmarks here of how the system works, we think we probably have verified five of those. We're still looking for ways to look at PARP activation in the systems, and we want to do some IP pull-downs here to look at AIF, MIF, uh, physical interaction. But it looks pretty good that, in fact, um, what the system is doing is it eliciting this DNA damage-induced in in mechanism of cell death. And the good news about that is uh, that PARP is involved not only in that particular pathway, but it's also involved in this uh, other pathway called CGMP-dependent death that some of you interested in photoreceptor degeneration may have read about. And so long story short there, I don't want to belabor the point, but it, literature is now coming up that suggests there is a common non-apoptotic cell death mechanism that is actually sort of the calling card of many hereditary retinal degenerative disease states. This is the work uh, of a gentleman named Francois pacat Durand. He took in this particular paper, 10 different retinal degenerative disease models and looked at the biochemical pathway by which the cells are dying and could only find evidence of apoptosis in, I believe, one of them. But uh, PARP-dependent pathways were common to all of them. Um, he subsequently then um, uh, ran down this idea of essentially this being a process mediated by elevated CGMP. 
and that PARP is a, is a, is a component of that particular pathway that's critical to mediate death in that um, model. The reason my antenna went up about it wasn't at all related at the time to inherited retinal degeneration. It was actually within the context of Parkinson's. And that was um, work that had been coming out of the lab of Ted Dawson at Hopkins, who has some really nice recent reports basically identifying MIF as a nuclease, um, most notably recently in science and, and other science papers on the topic, where Ted believes that this is the way by which dopaminergic neurons die, that, that, that if you wanted to target a particular cell death pathway pertinent to Parkinson's, this would be the, the pathway you'd, you'd be wanting to study. And so um, I think you know, it, it looks then like our, our long and twisted route of getting here had some relevance to neurodegenerative disease. Um, sort of very thankfully, and um, the lead, crown, lead compound uh, hopefully has relevance to genetic models of RP as well. And to test that, um, we've gone to RetNet like a lot of people and, and noted that there's a lot to do. And in particular, uh, we used a CRISPR-Cas9 multiplexed process to target uh, four different genes involved in retinitis pigmentosa and had a recent um, uh, publication in uh, Frontiers in uh, Developmental Cell Biology, I believe, um, basically characterizing uh, rhodopsin-based autosomal dominant mutant, but we have now several other recessive models as well, and we're very interested in asking, you know, how many of these different forms of genetically linked retinitis pigmentosa can be ameliorated with the compounds that we're testing. And so that's kind of where we're at with that one. Okay, so summary overall, in terms of HDS Ready, I hope I've convinced you that this kind of robotics automated platform is about as close as we can get um, to, to getting there, and the trick to that is just numbers rather than images at the first, at the first area of in interrogation. Just, you know, find a way to light up with reporter-based systems the biology you're interested in, and you can go much faster and really take advantage of the scale um, that whatever system your study is capable of. Um, degenerative disease, uh, yeah, I think that Jerry's still out, but I hope I've provided some evidence to suggest that this may in fact um, have some relevance, this relatively artificial system um, that I didn't have much faith in in this regard seems to definitely have some interesting leads in that regard. And um, I don't have time to tell you about it, but I think we're about to have a paper come out on this improved NTR enzyme that's going to allow us to do some fun things in that regard, uh, namely sustained ablation paradigms where we could actually create chronically inflamed fish that can't solve this problem in, the matter, in a matter of 24 or 48 hours and ask whether that alone is enough to sort of ground out regenerative capacity. If you have a fish that's faced with 50% cell death for a month rather than just a single day, does that create a cascade of inflammatory related signaling that, that impinges on its, and its regenerative capacity? And then finally, um, just summarizing there that we about 3,000 drugs, 350,000 larvae. We got some novel neuroprotectants and some novel insights into potential mechanisms by which to save photoreceptors. And with that, I just want to thank Leun, uh, who did the lion's share of all that work. Uh, many people uh, uh, that we got a lot of help from, uh, both within Hopkins and outside of Hopkins, to, to follow up on various leads are in blue there. Um, and the funding agencies, by, by far, Foundation Fighting Blindness, really taking a chance on that project and, and allowing us the, the sort of levity to go after uh, a deeper understanding of what we were up to on that, on that level was really, really helpful. So thank you very much for your attention. Question? Yeah, Abby. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that PARP might be mediating or being involved in some of those other pathways now, or could they, so PARP regulating CRISPR for three patients, or other patients? Yeah. Yeah, ironically, I, I did some homework real quick last night because a lot of this is new to me. And, and I, I looked at, um, so sorry, uh, to repeat the question, is it possible that some of the additive effects of the compounds are actually by virtue of PARP having uh, the ability to impinge on some of those other pathways we saw implicated, like P53 and the like? And I think that's definitely uh, a strong possibility. Um, whether the drugs themselves are 
able to do that or whether it's a securitist route by which all of that's being mediated is really a, a black box for us right now. But certainly, um, I think it's a strong possibility and, and definitely PARP is, there's a long list of things that it's been implicated in and P53 is definitely one of them. And so uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do. And um, I think you and I discussed earlier, I wanna take kind of an agnostic approach to doing um, some proteomics on exactly who the targets might be of some of these compounds and then working through a process of identifying beneficial targets and things that are mediating toxicity, anti-targets, and trying to work through a logical way to, to get through uh, the process of developing better and better drugs. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, wait. And actually, in the uh, pro drug, it became um, a hydroxylamine derivative to kill the cell. Yeah. Could it be like your target, uh, your drug candidate screen uh, depend on this uh, pro drug? If you choose other way to kill the cell, then you maybe come up with a different panel from this 3,000 uh, drug. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the question is, you know, we controlled for nitroductase inhibition, but we didn't control for the presence of metronidazole, the prodrug that we were using. And is it possible that some of our neuroprotectants are acting against essentially the activated metabolite of the prodrug to block the damage that way? And you're right, we don't know, and it's a distinct possibility. And could we use other methods of killing the cells to eliminate that possibility? The, the, absolutely true. And that's why uh, at the end there, I was talking about some of the new um, CRISPR-based genetic models we're generating. Uh, we don't want to try and do any large-scale testing with them because the onset of some of those degenerations is, is randomized a bit too much for our taste. So it'd be really hard to do those screens at the scale we've been able to with the nitroductase system. But as a secondary assay, absolutely. And we're in, in the process of doing that now. Um, certainly their activity in mouse genetic models would suggest um, that some of them, uh, the ones that at least have activity, around 50% uh, confirmation rate of those 11 drug candidates would suggest that um, that isn't all they're doing. And that we were, that's why we focused in on dihydro and in fact, because we had that working across all three assays. And, um, but, I, but I think you're absolutely right. We, there's, there's opportunities to control for, for the two major caveats there, whether it's direct enzymatic inhibition or whether it's inhibition of, of the uh, DNA adducts that are a result of that enzymatic activity we need to control for. Yep. Anybody else? Sandra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think absolutely. So Sandra's question is whether, you know, the the pro drugs we're using or the drugs that we're using to to mediate neuroprotective effects have any effects on the microbiome. And um, anybody who's been on an antibiotic course <laughs> for any disease uh, knows that the interaction with the gut can be quite dramatic. And um, it, absolutely, yeah, we were working with John Rawls uh, at Duke, who's an um, expert in, in microbiome and fish and came out of J Jeff Gordon's lab at Wash U uh, with working in mice um, as well. And so I, I would guess absolutely. Um, that certainly at the levels that we're putting that antibiotic in, um, we've been able to observe some very kind of amusing byproducts of, of what happens to the gut uh, when, when we put 10 millimolar metronidazole in. And um, we're hoping that this new version that gets us down to 100 micromolar levels to affect um, actually more, more effective ablation at 100 micromolar than we've ever been able to do at 10, um, we we're very interested in actually asking how much we've attenuated that problem, at least with the pro-drugs, because I think that's a very um, salient point, and certainly there's literature out there on a number of different things that, that metronidazole is capable of doing that, that we aren't controlling for currently. So I think, yeah, the, the good news is that this new one, you know, and, and hopefully we'll have 
you know, we're calling it NTR 2.0, and hopefully there'll be a 3.0 at some point that eventually gets us just well away from all of those caveats and, and certainly well away from the general toxicity that has always been a huge, huge sort of thorn in my side uh, in terms of using the system. So, yeah, it's a good question. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, everybody.